Let's clap for Jesus. Hallelujah. Without wasting much of the time, let's join our hands as we welcome the Archbishop. Thank you. Please be seated. When the heavens open physically, like today in the morning, then you know the spiritual outpouring is also there. We are physical, and God always affirms spiritual things physically. Because for God so loved the world that he gave his son who was born of a woman in Bethlehem. Grew up in Nazareth so that we could see and we could hear and we could touch because we are physical. I bless God for the great opportunity he has given me to be back. Welcome again to this afternoon's ministry. I know it's a bit chilly, it's a bit wet, but it's good for us because it tells us God loves Uganda. And I want to thank God. I've been to Israel several times, and it's a very dry place. Why it is called a land flowing with milk and honey, I don't understand. But God chose it, chose it to be the place for his children given to Abraham. And I thank God for Uganda too, because I would have thought this is the land to be called flowing with milk and honey. It's a very beautiful country. Pastor Ben and your dear wife, you need to do a bit of traveling around and if God can give you mission opportunities, please go east, go west, and then go north. Then end up in maybe where I come from. And then you'll begin to know what Uganda looks like. Father, thank you so much for the privilege to be in your presence because you have called us. Your powerful, attractive love has brought us together. And you are people who are longing to come to you, to listen to you, to look you in the face to begin to hear what you are saying to individuals. I've come. The others who are on the way, we are asking them to come to. Lord, I bless you. This is a very rare privilege. You give it to us because you are God who gives and you are a generous giver. Open our hearts, open our ears. Lord, we want to see Jesus. We want to understand Jesus. He's speaking to us and he wants us to know him. And I bless your mighty holy name. Because your presence is here. I feel you. I sense you. I thank you. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. And amen indeed. We looked at Jesus, the bread of life. This morning in John chapter 8 and look at verse 12. Jesus is speaking again. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, will have the light of life. The bread of life, the light of the world. This is a very amazing story here. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. Let me read you within context why this declaration comes in verse 12. Look at verse 1. But Jesus went to Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They are using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones passed, 
until only Jesus was left with a woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and live your life of sin. And when Jesus spoke again, he said to the people, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Amazing. I love the way Jesus Christ is down to earth. I love the way that God is not sophisticated as people want to make him to be. No. God is so simple that the simplest person can understand him. And yet he's not simplistic. That even the highest mind can never understand God. God brings himself down to become a human being, although God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And yet he becomes us. In the morning, he is out there in the temple court at dawn and is teaching. The hunger level at that point is like the hunger level in our country today. Today, Ugandans are hungry for God and have found it all over the place, even in the city. People are looking for God. And because there is a hunger, people don't choose what to eat. Some of these uncontrollable hunger make them eat what they are not supposed to eat. They are seated there, they are listening to this rabbi, they are always sitting down during Jesus' day. The rabbi sits down, everybody sits around him, and then he teaches them. And he was teaching in the temple courts, holy place by the way. And then the Pharisees and the scribes, teachers of the law, brought in dragging a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. For, the, for her that morning wasn't a good morning. Why? You have been caught in adultery. You are brought in the temple courts of all places to meet a famous Galilean rabbi called Jesus of Nazareth, a popular man, seated and teaching. Your shame and your embarrassment is multiplied by a hundred. Your fear is so high because you are only a woman and all these men are itching to kill you because they found you sinning. You are alone. You are helpless. And you are shivering because at any moment the, the judgment has already been passed. You know you are not safe. And it is true, they came to Jesus Christ and said, the law commanded that we should stone somebody like this woman. What do you say? We caught her red-handed. What do you say? Her life was gone. The bottom of where she was standing had fallen down. Her courage had gone. Her life was hanging between life and death. She knew any time she would go. Jesus listened. Jesus began to write. They kept on accusing the woman. But Jesus was writing. And as he wrote down, I don't know what he was writing, but I may give you a guess a little later on. But he was writing all the same. I don't want you to say that when Jesus Christ is in the presence of a sinner, and the sinner doesn't know it, that's a very sad moment. You want a sinner to know who Jesus is, then they can take courage like the thief on the cross you would remember. The one on the left insulted Jesus, called him names. If you are the Messiah, save yourself and us too. The one on the right said, don't you even fear God? We deserve where we are. What sin has he committed? And then you know he remembered Jesus. He said, Lord Jesus, remember me when you come to your kingdom. When a sinner realizes there is a savior, he has courage. But when a sinner does not know there is a savior like this woman, her world is dark. And our world is confused. But you know, sin always makes you and me walk in darkness. When you are living in sin, you are in darkness. This woman here has a huge problem. So is the man who was with her. The darkness that they were walking in was the undervaluing of who they were. When one goes into adultery, you are undervaluing that you are actually made in the image of God. This woman has stripped herself naked. 
This man has stripped himself naked, exposing his nakedness before a stranger. This woman possibly is married. She only has one partner called a husband. This is a stranger. But she's stripping herself naked before a stranger. This man possibly has a wife, a wife of a covenant. But he's also stripping himself naked. Why? Because both are in darkness and blind. This exposition in adultery is a very humiliating thing for a person made in the image of God. And every time I walk in adultery, I am abusing the God who made me in his image and I'm abusing the wife of my covenant. Every time I'm exposed to another partner, and by the way, this is not only sexual, it is also worship. Because God always accused Israel for being adulterers because they worship idols. Because they went to other gods. That too is adultery. Because God is the husband. Jesus is the bridegroom. The moment you go to worship something else other than Jesus Christ, other than Jehovah God, you are in adulterous relationship. You are exposing yourself to a partner not of a covenant to you. These two were in darkness. These two never knew. They were in utter ignorance, and they did not understand that the consequences of this is very deadly, because it is death according to Scripture, according to the law of Moses. Equally, the religious leaders were as blind as the two who were in adulterous relationship. Why? Because they were saying, according to the law of Moses, according to the law of Moses, this woman must be stoned to death. Yes, but is it true? It is not true. Look at Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10. And let's read what the law actually says. Leviticus 20, verse 10. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress, are to be put to death. So the question you want to ask is, and where is the man? If this is a woman who is caught in adultery, was she committing adultery with herself? Where is the man? Where is the man? They knew that they were too not quoting the law according to what it should be done. Now let me tell you why Jesus was writing. May I believe through the scripture that all that Jesus was writing was, where is the man? Oh, but this woman, we caught her doing, committing adultery, and we caught her red, red-handed. Where is the man? And by the time he straightened up to tell them, that let him who has not sinned be the first man to stone this woman, they had already seen the sentence passed on them as he was writing down. That's why the older ones began to go, because they saw the point. They, they knew they had com- committed sin too by not quoting the law right. The adulterer and the adulteress are supposed to be stoned to death. Not just one weak woman who possibly was not running faster than the man. Is it because he was a weak person? Is it because the man bribed them? Is it because something else happened that made the man run away? Or did they let the man go away? Why should it be a woman to be victimized? Where is the man? The law said kill both of them by stoning. But then when the light shone in the hearts of these leaders, they began to walk away one by one. I will tell you who they remembered. They remembered King David. If you turn with me, if you may, in Psalms 51 and verse 5, King David was crying and his heart was breaking. In verse 5 of chapter 50, 51, you read this lament from a man who was called to be a man after God's own heart. Verse 5. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. David admitted that sinfulness does not come as a result of action. If I steal, am I a sinner? If I fornicate, am I a sinner? If I commit adultery, am I a sinner? If I rob, am I a sinner? If I'm greedy and I cheat Ugandans, am I a sinner? Do those things make me a sinner? No, they don't. They don't. 
I am a sinner, that's why I steal. I am a sinner, that's why I commit adultery. I am a sinner, that's why I'm a drunkard. I am a sinner, that's why I'm a robber. Those are fruits from the roots that are within my system. And they were there when I was conceived in my mother's womb. That's where it started, friends. I was born a potential sinner. I grieve over people who when they hold their tender little chubby babies and they say, my angel, oh, my angel, my angel. Why are you deceiving yourself? That's a human child. A potential sinner, by the way. Just give it time. Just give it time. That fellow is going to go into tantrums. I have seen babies because I am a father of children. I have seen babies. They are sitting on their mother's lap. They are, they are sucking breasts. They are only one, not even two. One. And their hands are on the other breast. And they are feeding on one breast. That is corruption already beginning <laughs> in the child. That is a child showing the tendency of corruption. It's a baby, friends. The thing starts from the womb. That's what David is lamenting about. Then when I was born, I was already a sinner. These leaders understood David's plight. He was crying. Why was he crying? The reason why David was crying was because David committed adultery as a king with the wife of Uriah. He did not stop there. He killed the man whose wife he committed adultery with. To cover up. It is so sad when you read first, Second Samuel chapter 11. I would love you to read that scripture. We are not going to read that scripture because it is a long one. But when you read how David looking at this beautiful woman having a bath. Because he was walking up there on the flat roof of his palace. Now why was he walking up there? He was lazy. At this point all kings went to war. He did not go to war. He had a siesta after a good meal. Now he's walking up on the roof. Then he saw a woman. Fine, David, if you saw a woman, you have two options. You have eyelids, you can close your eyes. Or you can turn another direction and not see again. But he saw again and he saw again. And by the time he saw three, four times, he sent a messenger to get that woman. And then when the woman came to him, David, you should have just talked about this woman, find out whose wife she is, whose daughter she is, and then leave her alone when you knew she was married. But then he went ahead and committed adultery with this woman, the king of Israel, a, a choir master, a singer, a dancer, a man after God's own heart, is betraying the wife of a soldier fighting for him out there. He's a king. Is a king. And I'm a pastor in Uganda. I am grieved when I hear fellow pastors leaving their wives, picking members of their congregation, committing sexual Ill 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 sin with them, immorality with them. And they are men of God. And they stand here and they want to preach the gospel. And is the Holy Spirit going to hang over you? Will you be anointed? Will it stop you preaching? No, you will still preach, but empty some sermons. You can impress, but you will never bless. This is going on over and over and over. And I hear cases, girls coming to me. Pastor so-and-so did to me, this to me. Pastor so-and-so did this to me. A king of Israel, second king of Israel, committed adultery with the wife of his soldier, a Hittite fighting in the war. And then the woman came back to her, to him rather, and said, I'm pregnant. Now, pregnancy is an amazing development. It starts like nothing. Then as the time goes by, it begins to expose itself. And David fearing that sooner or later the truth will come out. The guy is fighting in war. Bathsheba is going to begin to have her tummy protruding. What is he going to say? They are going to ask her. And what are they going to say? So he sent Joab a message. Send Horiah to come back home. And Horiah came back home as a very loyal so soldier of the mass. And this is a commander in chief wanting him home. He gave him very good supper. Gave him a little bit of wine. Give a gift, say, go back home, wash your feet, lie down with your wife, enjoy yourself. According to the law, if you are in war, even if you come home, you don't go into your family for sexual relationship with your normal wife. You don't. That is the law. 
And the guy knew the law. And he's not a Jew. He's a Hittite. So he never went there. He slept with the, soul, with the servants of the king at the gate. And David heard about it. What is David trying to do? He wants to cover up. He wants to cover up. And it's very easy to cover up because that's a human tactic. A human tactic doesn't go very far because the Bible tells me, be sure your sin will find you out. Second day, entertained him, gave him too much wine. The man was pretty tipsy. He said, go home. And the guy is full of the Spirit of God. He's not going to go home. He understood, he knew the law. The king does not know the law. So he wrote a letter, which is a death sentence to him, gave it into his own hands to Joab, who put him in a very serious war front, and he was killed. And the message came back, Uriah is dead. There was a little bit of a temporal peace on the heart of the king. Until chapter 12, when prophet Nathan came and told a wonderful story. I wish you could read that. My time is not plenty. That story is a story which is a powerful story. Prophets, let me tell you something. If you are moving in prophetic ministry, may the Lord give you wisdom. You remember that John the Baptist spoke very harshly to Herod and he lost his head. But prophet Nathan spoke very wisely to King David and he got the king repenting. That let me say, for every sin, God has mercy, God forgives. God forgives. Let me read you these verses. It is 2, two Samuel chapter 12, and they tell you the other side of God, which is quite helpful. 2 Samuel chapter 12, but let me read verse 9 to 12 for you quickly. Verse 9 says, this is God speaking through Nathan. Why? Did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and took his wife to be your wife? You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites? And God is going to speak these words and they're going to be hard in verse 10. Now therefore the sword will never depart from your house. Because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. But even so earlier on, God through Nathan said, you are not going to die. I spare you. But the sword will not depart from your house. Not only that, in verse 11, this is what the Lord God says. Out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to the one who is close to you. And you will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Let me ask you, Ugandans, people of God, children of God, I beg you in the name of Jesus Christ. Adulterous relationship has got devastating effect, not only to the person who does it, but also to the seeds of the person. My father was a polygamist. My father had two wives. We never knew peace in our home. My mother and the other woman always quarreled with this other, uh, the issue we never understood. None of them smiled to each other. I never saw peace in my home, and especially when my father is around is when they really quarrel. They really quarrel, and they really talk. Until my father would shout, shut up, and they keep quiet. After two minutes, they're on again. And she, he, he is a subject of all this contention. And because of polygamy, I need to tell you that if Jesus never took control of my life in the age of 18, I would have fallen victim as well. I would have not been stable in my marriage. I would have been wanting women. But Jesus took control, and he's in the cockpit up to now. And I will want him to be in charge. But you see, although David and Bathsheba were not stoned to death according to the law, the consequences came. Let me give you three consequences which took place. Consequence number one is in 2 Samuel chapter 13. We are not going to read it because that's a long, good chapter. Take some time and read it yourself. But there was a son, an older son, 
an older son to David. His name is Amnon. Amnon fell in love with his own sister. Her name is Tamar. He fell in love so much that he fell sick. Sick to the point of going to bed. The guy could not eat. I hope he could not even sleep. The guy just fell in love. I don't think he fell in love. He fell in lust with his sister Tamar. Until his cousin came to him and said, Son of the king, what's your problem? He said, I have fallen in love with my sister and I don't know what to do about it. And the brother, the cousin brother said to him, Are you not the son of the king? You go to bed. You tell the king and let him come. And when he comes, say to him, May my sister Tamar come to my house and prepare food so that I may eat from her finger and that will be a medicine strong enough for me to get me up on my feet. And the king sent the sister to come. And she came and prepared food as he watched, hoping this is going to heal. He was not watching the food, he was watching the woman. And when the food was ready, he ordered everybody out of the house and said to the girl, bring the food in my bedroom. Poor girl didn't even know what was happening. Poor girl thought she was helping a brother who was sick. The brother had skimmed other things rather than receiving food from his sister. And when she went into the, to the room, he caught her and raped her. And raped her. She was a virgin. She came out of that room wailing. She put ashes on her head, tore her virgin garment and because she's now defiled she's no longer a virgin she went weeping and wailing to her brother Absalom and the young man when she pleaded she said please don't chase me away don't send me because this is going to be very painful you're going to be a stupid fool he could not listen lust is short lived love is long long suffering patience gentle love is great but lust no he bolted the door, chased the woman out, made his attendants take her away. Do you know, in our families today, the sin of incest is very common. Beloved, I ask you in the name of Jesus Christ that you lift families that struggle with incest. That's when relationship is within families. That became true because the Lord spoke. That your own house will struggle, calamity will come on them. David is a cause, friends. If you are a father like me, watch your life. Watch your sexual relationship. Watch how you relate with people. If you are a father like me, do not bring calamity and curses on your children by the way you are relating outside your marital relationship with your wife. That's number one consequence. Number two consequence. In, verse, in chapter 13, verses 23 to 33, Absalom murdered Amnon. A brother killed a brother. In revenge to the raping of his own sister. Tamar was a sister of Absalom. And the brother killed a brother because of the shame. And because she now cannot be married, she is now living as a recluse outside the family circles. She is no longer the proud girl who can walk around as a princess, the daughter of the king that is gone. Her self-esteem has disappeared. Her beauty has disappeared because a brother violated her virginity. So Absalom killed his brother. The Lord had said through Nathan, the sword shall not depart from your house. And a brother killed a brother. Not only that. If you read on, the third calamity that came is in chapter 16 of Second Samuel. And it is from verse 20 to 22. It's even getting a little bit difficult here, friends. Because Absalom drove David out of his kingdom in Jerusalem. He ran away. And he took over the kingdom. And one advisor to the king told Absalom to lie in broad daylight with the concubines of his, of his father were left in the palace to look after the palace. And they pitched a tent in the open place. And Absalom, the son of King David, had sexual relationship with the concubines of his father. You did it in secret. It will be done in broad daylight for you, David. Are you surprised in Psalms 51? Let me just read a few verses again because that to me is one area we can all go to 
and find cleansing when we are in utter sin, either of murder or adultery. David, thank God. You are so tender-hearted. You are open to God. And you have written this psalm for us. You said, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfaith, unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at, at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. In verse 7, cleanse me with high soap and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. In verse 10, hide, hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. And then in verse, that is verse 9, verse 10, create in me a pure heart, O Lord, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. You know, in verse 17, it's so moving, he said, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart you, God, will not despise. That's David the king crying before God. And no wonder, David, from his own tribe, Jesus came. He was a sinner just like you and me, but he was a repentant sinner. And if you are sitting here and you are a repentant sinner, let me give you the light of a revelation that will help you to walk in the light of God. Let me say these words to you. God has done something irrespective of who we are. Do you know what is very encouraging when I look at this lady before I get to give you this revelation? is in verse 10. In verse 10, we look at a therapy there. Therapy in verse 10 we look at Jesus saying, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? They, they had gone. The stones had been dropped and left behind. Where are the people who accused you? Has no one condemned you? And she says to Jesus, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. No. I don't condemn you. No matter what sin you walk in, even as I, I speak here and you are sitting in the church, no matter where you were yesterday or even earlier this afternoon, no matter how dark your sin is, no matter how horrible your life is, listen, Jesus will never condemn you. No. He will never condemn you. Others can judge you, not Jesus. Others can call your names, but not Jesus. Others can look down upon you, but not Jesus of Nazareth. No. Do you know why? You know John chapter 3 verse 16? You know that very well? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes should not die but have eternal life. You know that very well, isn't it? But you know the meaning of that verse is in verse 17. Verse 17 is even more powerful. It expounds verse 16. I'll read it for you. John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Hallelujah. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus Christ came to save. He came to seek. He did not come to condemn. Why? Because he knows we have fallen. We have fallen since we are in our mother's womb. We are born sinners and we are potential sinners subject of wrath and condemnation. How can he condemn us? No. He comes to save. He saves. He keeps. He satisfies this wonderful great Jesus. And so let me tell you revelations. And I know my time is running pretty fast, but I will go through them. Do you know as you sit, something is wonderfully bestowed upon your life and upon my life. With Jesus in, John chapter 1 and verse 11 becomes a reality to grasp, to hold on, and to hold and close to your heart. In verse 11, John says, these are the words of Jesus Christ. He came to that which is his own, but his own did not receive him. Those are Jews. Yet to all who did receive him and to those who believed in him, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, of a husband's will, but born of God. Let the light shine in your life right now. 
that you are given the authority to become a child of God. A child of God. We are children of God because we are born by God through the Spirit and the water. We are adopted into the family. That should make you begin to rise up in your heart. If you are very disappointed by the part of this sermon, now your hope should rise up that in spite of what I was, God has made me his child because I have believed and I, I have received Jesus Christ. And Jesus in me gives me the authority to become a child of God. Hallelujah to that. Do you know that really makes me proud as a Ugandan who knows Jesus Christ? It makes me so confident wherever I go in the world, in the streets of London, in the streets of New York, I walk as a Ugandan born of God, a child of God, has a destiny I'm going to, and I have a right and authority. A child of God. Now that makes me very, very confident in my life, in your life, in the streets of Kampala. Even if you're walking after jumping off a border, you are a child of God. Yes, you are. Now that is number one, and that should be the light in which you should walk in. Walking has the child of God. The second thing, in chapter 15 of the same book of John, look at verse 15. In verse 15, Jesus makes another beautiful, beautiful declaration there. I no longer call you servants. Because a servant does not know the master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I've learned from my father, I have made known to you. Hallelujah. You are my friends. He's talking to the disciples, Peter, John, James, Matthew, Philip, Bartholomew, all those guys. But you know, he's also talking to me. He's also talking to you. You are my friends. You are my friends. Now, a friend is somebody with whom you can see eye to eye. I am a bishop. I have a young woman here. She is my niece. She is called Dorcas. She is seated there. She is my friend. I can share with this girl things that are in my heart, and she will know them. She will appreciate them. She is much, much younger than me, almost younger three times. Friendship doesn't know age. Friendship doesn't know class. It doesn't know educational level. Friendship does not know anything else. Friendship is only that connection which brings even a greater God to a humbler human being, fragile and finite. The infinite can connect with the finite. The immortal can connect with the mortal. The, uh, the God over high, the imminent God, can come down and be with us. Friendship. You are the friend of Jesus Christ. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to come. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry. Jesus told us in, John, in, in Luke chapter 11, a friend came to a friend after midnight. The host friend went to a neighbor who is a friend, knocked at the door and said, friend, this is Orombi. I need three loaves of bread. My friend has just arrived. And John in the bed said, Orombi, please, I am in bed. My children are with me in bed. I can't get up to give you the bread you are looking for. And then Orombi knocks again. John, my friend has arrived. Give me three loaves of bread. Come on, Urombi, will you please wait until breakfast? Then Urombi knocks again. Then Urombi knocks again. Then Urombi knocks again. Why? Because John is a friend. John is a friend. John will understand that a friend in need is a friend indeed. 
John will get up because Orombi is bold. Orombi is bold because John is a friend. And when Jesus is your friend, you can go to him. You can go to him boldly. You can knock at his door. And you can knock until the answer is given you what you are looking for is given you. And you can knock and knock and knock if John was a stranger. And you are in need. And you knocked at his door. And he said, who are you? I'm Orombi. What do you want? Three loaves of bread. Rombi, get away from my door. Will I knock again? No, I can't. But John is my friend. Jesus is our friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. He grieves when you don't turn to him at your point of needs. He grieves when you are struggling and you are not talking to him. Listen, he will cry with you. He will walk with you. He will go through the narrowest road with you. He's there, he's the friend who sticks to you closer than a brother. We have the privilege to know Jesus is our friend. This light must shine into your heart to open it for you. Not only that, look at verse 16 of the same book. In verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you might go bear fruit, fruit that will last. Now look at what happens next. That whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. I chose you, I appointed you. You know, a guy like me, let me tell you, friends. You know, when we talk in Uganda, I come from a humble background. You know what that means? It means I come from a very poor background. Some of us begin to claim poverty in, in our childhood. Well, I come from a background which was very poor indeed because my first pair of shoes, I was 17 when I put them on. I, le I slept on a mattress when I was 17 years old. All along I was on a mat all the time. Did that embarrass me? No. Why? Because my father gave me those things. Am I embarrassed? No. Because I didn't choose that man to be my father. I never chose that woman to be my mother. I just found myself there anyway. Beloved, listen to me. You never choose your past. But you can choose your destiny. Where you are going, you make a choice. Where you come from, you don't. So don't be embarrassed by where you come from. In fact, when I was a teacher in Lira, I took a, an Irishman to go home to my village in Pakwach. When we got home, they gave us a papyrus mat to lie on. I had a, a pair of sheets. He had a sleeping bag. Now, Pakwach weather is like a sese. The guy got into the bag. I was sleeping next to him on a papyrus mat. And mosquitoes in Pakwach, friends, if you are coming, bring some net with you. The mosquitoes descended on us, and this guy was in a sleeping bag. The temperature rose up. It was hot. He opened it up. The mosquitoes came. He zipped it up, and then they opened up. The guy never slept. Was I embarrassed to take him home? No. That's my home. Why should I be embarrassed to take him home? God then taught me he is my friend when I met Jesus. When my friend Jesus met me, he began to walk with me. Then I could talk to him. Then I could explain myself to him. Then he began to understand that this is a friend of mine. I better let him know my plan. And he will let you know the plan he has for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. That you will walk with him and you will come to him, you will pray to him, you will listen to you, you will seek him. You will find him when you seek him with all your heart. What a friend we have in Jesus. So we are chosen and appointed. Not only that, according to Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 20, we are also given another responsibility. Let me read it for you also. 5.20 says these words, and I find them very encouraging. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. An ambassador in Uganda, when he goes to the public, is addressed, Your Excellency. An ambassador. Your Excellency. Your Excellencies who are seated here. You present the king of the universe. You are so highly placed in the diplomatic missions on earth. Even in your own family, you are an ambassador. You are a representative of a kingdom, which is way up there, ruled by Jesus Christ. You may as well behave like an ambassador. You may as well behave like the one who sent you. Because the one who sent you owes every respect bestowed on you to be executed wherever you are. The ambassador of Christ is your title. Lord, thank you. 
I own a diplomatic passport in, the, in Uganda. And when I go out of this country, I go through VIP by virtue of the passport. Unfortunately, they don't consider it in the plane. If you do not have the proper ticket, it doesn't work. <laughs> but in Uganda, in Uganda, I am a VIP. You are not a VIP in Uganda only. You are a VIP on planet Earth. Your father, your father owns the universe. And your employer is the richest person on earth and in heaven. Hallelujah. I only pray this thing goes into your spirit and begins to make your hope rise up. To begin to feel what God is saying because God is not a liar. And then finally, we know our time is rounding up now. There is the best thing that I find I need to speak to Ugandans about. Do you know that you are so expensive as an individual? They're not even the richest men in the world called Bill Gates can pay for you. He can't. Only Christ can afford you. Because Bill Gates only pays in dollars. Christ pays in his own life blood. Bill Gates can never die for you, my friend. But Christ died for you. He cared for you enough that you would hang on that cross. He was willing to receive the crown of thorns on his head. He was willing to put up his hand to be nailed on that cross. His feet put together and nailed on that cross. He was willing to put up the hostility of people who spat on him, insulted him and beat him up for your sake. Because he loves you and he loves me. My friend, that is what rings a bell in my heart. That God, you love me that much. Now let me tell you the truth. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, look at how valuable you are. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let me read for you these verses. In verse 18, Paul says to the Corinthians, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you? Whom you have received from God? You are not your own. No, you are not your own. You are bought at a price. Hallelujah. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. If God chose me to be the temple that the Spirit will dwell in, then I am so expensive. When we launched your building program, at that time it was costing 9 million US dollars. I hope it is still 9 million US dollars. My friend, that's a magnificent building. And I'm praying it will be built. And I'm praying that it will be one of the most important places people come to Uganda will go and see. And then go and worship in is my prayer. But let me tell you these words. The Holy Spirit will not dwell in that building. No. Because you built it. He dwells in the building he builds. And that building is in you. It is only when the temple here goes to that building that they take the presence of God in there. That as you go in the anointing of the Holy Spirit and your pastor stands in the pulpit in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, then God honors your presence there. Then when you lift your voices up to honor him, then he comes and dwells on your praises. That God chose me to be the temple of the Holy Spirit, Lord, I thank you. I thought I was a nobody, you made me somebody. I thought I did not belong, so you made me belong somewhere. I, I, I thought I was nothing, but I'm somebody because your spirit dwells in me. Then he says, you are not your own. No, your body is not your own. You cannot just mess about with your body, do what you like with it. You're kind. That body is the property of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are only a tenant. You are only looking after it. You better look after it well for him. Let him find you faithful and let him find you looking after your body very well. Because he says, therefore, honor the Lord with your body. You are bought at a price. It's not in dollars, not even in diamonds. Neither is it in anything. It is in the blood of Jesus, the priceless blood of Jesus that was paid for your redemption. He bought us to himself by dying for us. Just say to yourself, I am important. With the confidence, I am important. 
No matter what the devil tells you. No matter what the devil tells you, you may stand in front of a mirror and the devil say, look at your nose, look at your eyes, look at your ears. Look at those large lips. Look at that long face or look at that round face. You tell the devil, I'm important. The master designer designed me like no other person. I am a unique person and I belong to him. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I belong to him. You see, it's very easy to argue down the devil by truth. And it's only truth that can set you free. You are bought with a price, therefore honor God with your body. By the way, you are very expensive. The light of God, walk in that light of God and know that you are a child. That you are a friend of God. That you are chosen. You are an ambassador. You are supposed to bear fruit. And you are expensive. I am the light of the world. Whoever comes to me will not walk in darkness. We'll have the light of life. Glory to the Father. And to the Son. And to the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Pastor Ben, come and pray for us, my brother. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Can we stand up? I want to give you 30 seconds to reflect on the word that you've heard. That you are a kingdom VIP. I want you to reflect on the fact that the dollars of this world cannot purchase you. I want us to reflect on this fact that we are very important. Probably you walked in here depressed, downcast, and discouraged. I pray that the light of God's word will refire you. That the light of God's word will recharge you up. Father, we just want to thank you. For these sweet words you have reminded us of whom we are. It is a privilege for us to be kingdom VIPs. Irrespective of our social status, irrespective of our financial status, we are still privileged to be born again, to be born of your spirit. Lord, we thank you. As many that came into this meeting discouraged, Lord, may they leave here encouraged. As many that came into this meeting downcast, may they be lifted up again. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we have prayed.